So I'm Fred Bever. I'm the Chief Information Officer here at MDI Biological Laboratory, welcoming you all today to our uh, third edition with these wonderful people who are uh, uh, working on this multimedia, multi-science, multi-archive uh, research and presentation project around science communications. It's called Landscape of Change, Imagining the Future Shore this year. Uh, previous year was uh, a lot about birds and uh, butterflies and change on land. Now they're moving to the coast. With us today are Rainy Brandt. She's the Mount Desert Island Historical Society's Executive Director. Catherine Schmidt, who is a science communication specialist. She works with the National Park Service and Acadia, and she works with the Skudik Institute on various science communications projects. And Jennifer Boer, an artist and I believe photographer as well. I guess you can be a photographer and be an artist, uh, is also part of the project. Welcome to all of you, uh, and welcome to all of our guests. Mostly, uh, Rainey is going to be leading us through this year's presentation, and uh, we'll ask sort of at the beginning that if you have questions, you can use the chat function here to, to get your questions up, and I'll try to relay them, you know, particularly for clarifying questions early on, and then hopefully at the end, there'll be a little time for uh, a more of a back and forth uh, before we, we sign out. Uh, so with that, I'll just uh, thank you, you, our guests, and, and please uh, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I'm really excited to be here again for presentation about uh, Landscape of Change, which is a collaborative project between a number of island organizations. So I'm gonna um, share my screen really quick um, so we can get started. So Landscape of Change is a collaborative project that was started in 2020 with um, six different partners, both science, education, and um, history partners. We also have an advocacy partner with the Climate to Thrive, includes the Biological Laboratory, Acadia National Park, College of the Atlantic, and Skudik Institute, as well as the Mount Desert Island Historical Society. And we began this project with a simple question, can history inform the present? And we were specifically asking that question related to a series of historic resources and references that had really closely documented environmental conditions on MDI in the 1880s. And I wanted to know if those would be of value to scientists today. And it turns out they are. And the longer we have of a, of a data set that sort of looks at different pieces of information about the environment or, or ecosystems, the better we can understand how it's changing. And then the stronger our predictions can be for what happens to that in the future. So the goal of this partnership is to use historic resources to understand, understand the scope, scale, and speed of climate change here on MDI. And we started this project looking at four specific areas. One was um, birds, pollinators, um, sea temperature, and climate because those were some of the best documented records that we had from the Historical Society's collection through a series of logbooks taken in the 1880s to 1890s by the Champlain Society. If you'd like any additional information about that, um, we have previous recordings of our Science Cafe um, on the website, and then we also have on uh, both the MDI Historical Society and Skudik's websites, um, lots of different information about the Champlain Society and the role that they played both historically and in jumpstarting this project. But for those of you who have seen some of these um, presentations before, I won't go into detail about their, their presence here on the island, but they recorded very, very detailed uh, information about the day-to-day -day things that they found here on the island during that decade. So we took all that raw data and information, and then we had additional layers that we added from different uh, naturalists and scientists working on the island in the 1920s and 40s, and then from today. So we were able to use observations taken through iNaturalist or eBird, through citizen science initiatives, 
and um, compile all of those things onto a map, which you can access through the Landscape of Change website, where you can see here various dots that indicate different historic and modern populations and how they've changed over time. This information was compiled in our year one study, which you can also find available on our websites for free. And in this study, it documents the details of the changes we've seen. So for birds and pollinators, what species are moving into the area that weren't here historically, what species were here historically that are no longer present, and then what kinds of changes might be happening to the dynamics of the species who have maintained themselves on the island throughout um, the last century. And so the, that analysis is available in there, as well as information about temperature changes, precipitation changes, sea temperature and sea level rise. So a lot of great information has been gathered in the past through this partnership that measures real-time change on MDI that gives us really amazing and powerful tools to be able to advocate and understand and educate the general public for the work that we're doing. And part of the key importance of this partnership is the communication piece. So we're here tonight, but in addition to that, we try to find really innovative and creative ways of communicating. Both Catherine and Jen and I are all really focused on how we engage with the public. Science is not necessarily how everyone listens or speaks or understands the world around them. There are certain barriers that can be created just by communicating a scientific message. And so as a museum director and as a, as a historian, I have a certain different expertise related to interpreting complex information for the general public and sort of distilling that through exhibitions, through public programs in different ways. And then Jen brings a totally different skill set as an artist to evoke emotional responses to science and to information and to um, really engage people in a multi sensory way. And so by really extending the communication strategies through landscape of change, we are able to reach a very broad range of people with the same kind of information and messages that they may not otherwise access. And Jen will go into some really great details about her project and her portion of this um, partnership a little bit later. Mm -hmm. So, We've spent the last three years focusing on different aspects, as I've mentioned, birds, pollinators, um, climate and sea temperature. And this year we have decided that this partnership is gonna look at sea level rise. So I'm gonna turn things over to Catherine Schmidt, who's gonna go into a little bit more detail related to the sea level rise. Thank you, Rainey, and thank you, Fred, and everyone at the BioLab for hosting us um, and welcoming, welcoming us back. Um, so this is what we know about sea level at Bar Harbor, um, which has been measured since 1948. Um, and we know that sea level has risen about eight inches since 1950. Um, and because the ocean temperature is getting warmer, so warmer water expands. Um, and so that contributes to sea level rise. And the volume of water in the global ocean is also increasing as glaciers and land-based ice melt and so that's contributing to even greater rates of sea level rise. And so the rate has intensified from less than an inch per decade to now over an inch per decade. And the next slide shows how we know this from the tide gauge, which is on the Bar Harbor Town Pier. It's operated by NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. They even have um, this great information tacked right onto the tide gauge so you can go down there and read it and look at it. So um, measuring the water level is actually sort of a fairly simple exercise, but then sea level is also really complicated. Um, next slide. Another way that we can measure sea level rise is just from the impacts of it. So from Acadia National Park's perspective, these are some of the issues related to sea level rise and climate change on the coast that the park is concerned about. Public health and safety, flooding of water and wastewater systems, saltwater intrusion of drinking water wells, flooding and storm damage to low-lying roads and bridges, also eroding archeological sites, carriage road and trail washouts, eroding beaches, marsh flooding, and wind damage to forests. And we're seeing pretty much all of these things. Um, next slide. 
Um, these are some of the locations that we're interested in, both from the National Park Service perspective and Scudic Institute's perspective and as part of this project. So Scudic Point, obviously, um, we are concerned about. There's also some um, cultural and Wabanaki resources on Scudic Point that we're watching closely. Thompson Island, um, the Oceanarium, as you'll hear more about, Sand Beach, Seawall, Bass Harbor Marsh, and then kind of Stonesville um, kind of uh, village area. Next slide. So at Scudic, um, we are seeing erosion, especially at Fraser Point. And so this is just a gradual loss of land um, at the picnic area um, that gets worse kind of with, with every high tide and storm damage. Next. Um, these are scenes from Sand Beach where there's been erosion and actual slumping of the bluff um, on the west side of Sand Beach. And you can go and walk up and see some of this um, sort of ancient marine mud that's now been exposed by this bluff collapse. Um, and then the image on the left is showing um, a monthly high tide. So we're regularly seeing high tides reach the top of the beach and the toe of the slope on that side. Next. Um, we can also sort of indirectly measure sea level rise from the number of permit applications for shoreline stabilization. So this is not comprehensive at all. This is just like a quick survey based on public notices for these permits, which means there's at least 27 applications just in the last two years for people who need to stabilize their shoreline. And most of this stabilization is happening with riprap or other kind of hard structures, which then sort of impacts the shoreline on either side, as well as um, kind of hardens any habitat that might be there. Slide. Um, we can also indirectly measure sea level by looking at the forest where the salt marsh meets the woods. Um, and so these are ghost forests. And so the whitish trees that are in this image are spruce trees that have been killed as salt water reaches a higher level in the soil. And the next slide shows a researcher named Caitlin Littlefield, who was a second century stewardship fellow with Scudic Institute. And she's been looking at this interface between salt marsh and forest ecosystems. And she has documented a loss of greenness. So this, I, this um, phenomenon of ghost forest is happening um, in the park now. Um, high tide flooding. So this is also called sunny day flooding. So when we get the highest tides of the month, because the sea level is higher, the highest tides are higher. And so we're getting sort of this flooding on just a normal day associated with these extreme high tides. These are images from Thompson Island, where the picnic area is just, you know, things have to be sort of moved back every year. Next slide. Um, more images from Thompson Island from another monthly high tide um, in October. And this is sort of view of the road. And so Thompson Island is associated with our, the island's connection to the mainland. And so it's a really important and crucial location. Next. This also means that high tides and storm waves are higher and reach farther inland. And so this is just an Im image from um, a storm wave in January 2019 at Scudic Point that threw a bunch of ocean foam across the road, right? This is the road right where it goes out to Scudic Point itself. And of course, we've all experienced storms on Mount Desert Island, and these are just some scenes from Seawall. And, um, and the image, in fact, that was advertising this talk was from Seawall, completely covered in rocks that had been put there by storm waves. Um, and then these are pictures from Rainy. If you just want to talk about this, um, you know, when a when a storm happens at that monthly high tide, that is sort of a worst case scenario. And that is, in fact, what happened um, December 24th and 25th of 2022. Rainy, I don't know if you want to just add some comments on these photos. Yeah, so we went around my son and I um, over this holiday storm and just took some pictures knowing that we were having a, a storm event coming in on a on a king tide. And um, the inundation was remarkable. The, the picture on the upper left of the house is about a half an hour before height of tide. So you can see how vulnerable that property is. Um, that's a seawall actually built out into the sea, protecting the front of the house. 
And then the gallery in Soam Sound, right next to where the library is, this is their parking lot and back stairs completely inundated, which a lot of us have seen high tide impacts on this parking area, but I'd never seen it quite that high. And then this was really shocking to me. This is again about a half an hour on the bottom slide uh, before the height of tide. And this is at Hinkley. And this is pushing up into the street that is um, down along the waterfront at the Hinkley Boatyard. Um, both of those buildings are, are totally inundated with salt water. And it actually um, pushed across the street and up and into the other buildings on the other side of the street, totally blocking traffic and um, massive amounts of seaweed that were deposited in that space. So it really, I thought lent a lot of um, very interesting information for me to see where our vulnerable spaces are and how we need to plan for these um, as we as we start to look to the future. Um, so looking at the future, um, there's a lot of projections out there and there's a lot of visualizing tools where you can look at flooding and projections for sea level rise. And and the one thing I'll say, I'm not going to show a lot of those because I find there it can be overwhelming um, and confusing with so many options out there. Um, and so the one thing I'll say is it's just really important to go to the latest information. Um, and in 2022, all of the federal agencies got together to get consensus on sea level rise scenarios. And so this, this is what that report is. And they're, they're now all using the same data for sea level rise projections. So we have some really great consensus, up-to-date um, projections, which of course, as, as the climate changes and we learn more, these are constantly adjusted. Um, so next slide. So I'm um, just gonna show a couple different projections. <laughs> So this is based on that 2022 interagency report. Um, and this is from NOAA. Um, and this is showing projections, which is around a foot by 2050. It could be more, it could be, it could be closer to two feet, um, but about a foot um, is, a, is a good estimate to be thinking about. And what I like about the NOAA's chart is you can see the dashed black line on the left. So this is showing sea level rise from 1960 out to 2100. And they show, see, it'll track sea level rise every year. So they'll keep adding the new year of data. So you can see how actual data is tracking against the projection. And um, so I sort of like that. And then they have it, they also have it in feet and in meters. So different units that you can use. Um, and this is one, it's another thing to note is when does the projection start? So a lot of these actually start in 2000. And so we're already 20 years into the projection. So it's actually, we're, you know, we're already a few inches into that one foot towards 2050. Um, next slide. Um, if we look at the state of Maine, then you can look at, we can look at sort of more local projections. And so the state of Maine does have its own. And so in the Maine Climate Council scientific and technical report that came out in 2020, um, their consensus was that the state should commit to manage for 1.5 feet by 2050, so a little bit higher. And again, how high it goes depends on the decisions that we make about um, fossil fuel use and greenhouse gas emissions. And so they were saying that the intermediate scenario um, is one and a half feet, and then 3.9 feet by 2100. And then the state should be prepared to manage for an even worst scenario of three feet by 2050 and 8.8 .8 feet by 2100. So this is what state policy is now using. And so again, that one to one and a half feet by 2050 feels like a good estimate for us all to be thinking. Um, and so we can visualize, visualize them. So at Scudic Institute, we're working with a team of oceanographic modelers and climate modelers and landscape architects who try to visualize this. Um, this is an image of Thompson Island, and it's showing what would happen if the nor'easter that happened in January 2018, just one of any nor'easters we could have picked, what would happen if, with, if sea level rise was three feet higher? And really, you just need to pay attention to the light yellow that's showing the road being flooded. Um, so we can sort of take these 
historical scenarios and model them with sea level rise. This is just a draft visualization to give you a sense for um, the kinds of information that we have that can help us think about the future. Next. But we also have, we already have one and a half feet of variation just in our high tides. And so I think that the high tide level um, or king tide is another name for the monthly high tide that people use is a really great way to understand what does a couple inches of sea level rise really mean? What does a foot really look like? We already have a foot of difference between our average high tide and a monthly high tide. So this chart is showing the monthly high tide, the height, um, this is feet above mean low, low water. Um, so the height of monthly high tide from October 27th, 2022 through next April, 2024. And so it ranges from a little over 12 feet to a little over 13 feet. So that's one foot of range just in our monthly high tides. And it does vary. So certain times of the year, the tides are higher than others. Um, and so that so the former average monthly high tide was 11.37. So sea level rise keeps accelerating. And so the baseline data keeps shifting. And so it's very hard to sort of keep up with. Um, the highest astronomical tide, so the highest sort of natural tide recorded was 13.69 feet um, in 2016. So right now, our sort of highest highs of the year are around 13.1, 13.2 feet. So there was um, closer to 14 feet in 2016. And then the highest observed tide, which is shown in red, occurred during the uh, blizzard of 78. And that was 16.2 feet. So that was a storm-driven high tide observed. So this just sort of gives you a sense of um, the kinds of tides that it's possible to experience. And so thinking about high tide um, and low tide, because remember the low tides are higher too, so I don't mean to ignore low tide, um, but thinking about these different high tide levels can really help, help visualize and understand um, what sea level rise looks like um, in our communities. Next. Okay. Back to you, Rainey. Thank you. So we wanted to think about exactly excuse me, what Catherine said, which is what does sea level rise look like in our communities? When you hear it's risen two inches or even, you know, a foot of a higher tide than usual, it's really hard to get a, a good understanding of what that actually looks like on the landscape and how that plays out in our communities. And so in thinking about this phase of landscape of change and the, um, the what we wanted to sort of do with sea level rise was to look back in the historic records and look at different ways that people have recorded high tide events in the past. So this is just a few of many different records that we looked at related to storms specifically. So on the left two images, we have uh, an example of a high tide event that took place in Southwest Harbor with the sinking of this ship. And then on the right upper, we have, uh, which happens occasionally when Sand Beach watches, washes out and there's the wreck of the tie that is there, um, or the tay, that is buried under the sand and protects it most of the time, but every once in a while a storm will come out and wash it out. And so here's an example of an article written in 1963 of the exposure of the tay. And then Captain Prey, um, who was a notable Somesville captain for a number of years, we have some um, some remem remembrances of, of his different events that he had been witness to. We also used tide measurements from Harbor Masters, from the National Park Service, from recreational boaters who have taken you know height of tide measurements just for their own recreational purposes. We had some really interesting storm stories. We had an oral history that was recorded that we looked to from Mount Desert Rock, where the lighthouse keepers were recording a hurricane that was coming through and it washed out a large portion of the outbuildings on Mount Desert Rock and the porch around the lighthouse keepers residence. And the keepers had to flee to the top of the granite tower and they reported waves cresting at the height of the tower which is 72 feet so we have these sort of um 
anecdotal in some ways. We don't know the exact measurements of what these storms were creating or what they were producing, but we know the results and we know where they were happening and we can understand where they were impacting the different spaces on the island. And so it gives us places to look more carefully where, where we wanna um, maybe take observations and measurements. And it also opens up a whole lot of other historic resources if only we're using the right lens when we look at them. So as we review different letters, people have a tendency to write to one another about extreme events that have isolated them or created some sort of risk or were particularly exciting that they survived. We find lots of those kinds of things in letters because um, people were writing more frequently and so their day to day lives were being communicated to friends and family in different locations. And um, as more and more of those records are digitized, the better we're able to pull that information out and look at it. And so we wanted to look at these historic records to try to create, you know, somewhat more of a benchmark. But then like, so what? For me, I've, it, many of you have heard me say over and over again that history is relevant. And for me, I'm really passionate about how we make this information from the past relevant to people today. And so we were really fortunate. We applied for a grant for um, a climate change project using historic resources from Villanova University, which we received last year. And Catherine, Jen, and I worked with students at the Mount Desert Island High School in the AP Environmental Studies class that was taught by Ruth Poland. And she let us experiment with this project. We didn't necessarily know exactly what we were going to do with the students um, coming in, but we knew that the timing correlated with the king tide season and that Catherine had been really interested in creating a citizen science initiative of asking people to be out on the landscape photographing the height of tide during these king tide events which were taking place October, November, December and January. And coincidentally height of tide happened during their class time so we were able to get out and take a field trip out onto the island in October where um, we had the students engaging with the landscape and with the tides. The project started with a presentation of those historic resources that I just showed to you and so we talked to the students about what do high tide events look like? What do storm events look like on MDI? Where are the vulnerable spaces based on the historic records? So they got to sort of dig into those historic records and think about it. We had an account of um, from the 1880s of the bridge to MDI washing out. And there was actually in our records at the Historical Society, a bill for the repair of the bridge that was submitted to the, the bridge owners at the time. It was before it was managed by the state. So, so that was sort of a shocking thing for the kids to think about was the bridge washing out and having to replace the bridge and then um, the height of the storm waves cresting over Mount Desert Rock and so sort of what does that extreme look like and so they were able to think about examples of high tide events that they've witnessed and share those things out of spaces on the island where they've noticed a particularly high tide and, and observed that in other situations in their lives. And then we talked about what happens if a storm pushes in during a high tide, a king tide event. And they sort of scoffed at us like, oh, what are the odds? And then as I showed you the picture from the December storm, it was oddly enough, we were able to go out and take pictures and show them to the kids. Like, here it is, it happened. Here was a storm surge that came in on a, on a king tide. And this is what it looked like. So we took the kids all over the island um, and we took them out to the Oceanarium. And during the December event, the Oceanarium had experienced um, very high sea level flooding. They oftentimes get flooded at um, regular high tides into the parking lot, which they knew, but they had um, sort of unprecedented high tides during that storm. On the barn out at the Oceanarium, they had a foot of seawater in the bottom floor of the barn. And then in their admissions and their gift store office, they had six to eight inches of seawater during the tide, uh, the height of the tide. So the Oceanarium is coming up with some really innovative ways of making their site a sort of living laboratory or classroom of sea level rise and what we can be thinking about as solutions and what it's gonna look like for us as it pushes into some of our infrastructure. So for example, they're looking at um, making their buildings, if they 
they might put some of them on risers, but also building the bottom four feet of all buildings in replaceable materials so that every time they flood, they can easily replace the materials out with new material so that things aren't rotting or, or molding. They've moved all of their electrical systems four feet off the ground, so there's no risk for that. And everything else is sort of moved off the ground consistently. So it's a really interesting site for us to be considering and to think about. And we were able to take the students out there to look at that site as well. After looking at the sea level rise, um, I'm mean, sorry, the king tide um, sea levels out on the landscape in October, we also went to the Door Museum where they were learning about interpretation, how you communicate these things and what are like the key messages that you wanna convey about the importance of sea level rise. And so it was a really powerful, powerful project for the students and um, one that we hope to be able to replicate in the future. So this is um, what the students were contributing to. Um, so King Tide monitoring um, is, is not new to us. Um, it's been done across um, the United States and the world. I think the name King Tide um, kind of came from the West Coast and then from Australia. And so uh, we contribute to the Gulf of Maine King Tides project. And so anyone can contribute to this. All you have to do is just go out and take a photo during a King Tide um, and post it to Anecdata. It's a really great interface supported by the Mount Desert Island Biological Laboratory. And so the students contributed their observations, which I've shown a couple on the next slide. And um, you can go in and zoom in on this map and look at the photos that have been contributed over the years, not just um, since before my time. Um, there's, you know, there's older observations, but here's just an example of what the observations look like from our field trip with the students. So you just point the location and you add photos. Um, and so we are continuing this effort and we have a call for the public to participate. Um, and so the upcoming King Tides are actually happening in August this year. So the next slide um, is just a repeat of that date of the monthly high tide at Bar Harbor. And so they're actually gonna be occurring in early August. So August 3rd and 4th is our um, over 13 foot tide. So something to be aware of also, if a hurricane were happened to occur during that time, it's good to know that it's also a king tide because the threat, um, there are safety issues. Um, and then again in February and then next April. Um, so these are times when we're um, particularly interested, but you could go out on the regular monthly high tide um, you know, one of the lower ones that's just over 12 feet and take photos and contribute to anecdata data and then compare to see what does an additional foot, what is the difference in terms of the lateral impact on the landscape. Um, so these are dates when um, any of you who are um, listening tonight, um, we'd be happy to have you contribute to this project. And it doesn't have to be the places that we're interested in. You can, you can post any, any place that you're interested in or concerned about. So I mentioned that um, it was really important for us to be able to communicate this with the general public. And so I'm really excited that Jen is with us tonight to talk about the, um, the ways that she's been partnering with us to help with the communication piece. So I guess this is where I start chiming in. Yes. <laughs> All right. So my part in this project is very much a work in progress. Um, we've, we've got... We've got kind of an idea of where we're going, and now we're trying to like bring it out of out of our heads into real life. Um, I'm trying to create something that will appeal to people's curiosity. I mean, everyone loves puzzles and mysteries, um, and we've found that if something is really intriguing, a lot of people will take the time to figure it out. Like uh, last year, I did a series of mixed media images for the MDI Historical Society, part of this. Um, landscape of change about climate related phenomena around the island in 2021. I did a lot of research into the causes and I used the data to uh, construct a visual narrative. Um, this one is called the summer of the rash and it looked at the brown tail moth outbreak. Now Rainey had these printed on banners and earlier you saw a photograph of those banners outdoors at the historical society. Um, we took those to all different events on the island, including Family Science Night here at the Biolab. Um, we worked with Climate to Thrive, Art Waves, and so on. 
um, trying to take this idea out to audiences that wouldn't necessarily be looking for it. Um, next slide. This one is shrimp versus squid and was about the decline of the um, shrimp fishing industry in the Gulf of Maine. Now we found that the visual appeal of the drawings, like the blue and white and gold colors and the drawings of the sea creatures attracted attention. Um, people stopped and looked and they couldn't immediately figure out what was going on. And I had been worried that viewers would lose interest at that point and move on. But it turned out that a lot of people were curious enough to read the description and then try to decipher the drawings. Um, we also had these images hanging at Real Pizza for most of the summer. And our spies in the kitchen there told us that once people deciphered the drawings, there were a lot of lively discussions about how to interpret them, um, whether the artist was right or wrong, <laughs> um, how reliable the data might be. Uh, and, you know, from our standpoint, all right, people were talking, game one. <laughs> um, next slide. So for the sea level project, I'm trying to create a similar kind of engagement um, using curiosity to draw attention. So it creates a more participatory interaction. Um, like if you, if you hand people information, like a handout or an infographic, um, a lot of people, including me, are, uh, uh, our attention is very short <laughs> and like our eyes glaze over if you hand us too many graphs. Um, so as the project stands right now, I'm working on creating a graphic symbol that can be stenciled onto structures to mark the elevation of an estimated future sea level. The idea is that rather than providing like a didactic infographic, we're adding maybe slightly cryptic marks to the landscape hopefully driving viewers to start asking questions about them. Next slide. It's based on a fairly common symbol for water, the two or three wavy lines. And right now I'm trying to work the profile of MDI into that. I'm not sure yet if that bit's gonna work out visually. Um, I need to test this outdoors to see if that profile makes it too fussy maybe better to keep it simple. And for similar reasons, I'm not sure if we should include the year or not. Uh, next. So during the first part, these are, this is colored pencil on photographs. We haven't actually painted anything onto the buildings yet. Um, but during the first part of the project, we'll test sizes and colors for the symbol at the Oceanarium. And uh, next slide. Here I've, sort of trying to get an idea of what it would look like out in the landscape. I think I've got one more slide. Yep, testing the idea of using it on fairly large trees. Um, so later in the year, if things progress the way that we hope, we will have a map of estimated sea level rise around the island that could be used with a stencil of this symbol so that we could work with school groups, libraries, or other interested people in the community to extend this project around the island. Um, so eventually it would become an island-wide art installation. Um, Rini, I think the next slide's yours. Nope, that's the end. Yes, so um, as we sort of each have a chance to give our conclusions, I would encourage anyone who has questions or comments, or if you'd like more information or things to contribute to, please go ahead and put those in the question and answer or the chats, and we're happy to um, continue having the, the conversation. But I would say that um, what, I, what I love about Jen's work in progress is it shows that this collaboration is really innovative and ongoing, and that we're we're constantly trying to think about how we engage the public with the information that's taking place here in our community. And we want to always be thinking about sort of the so what and what is the call to action? What can people do? So as Jen mentioned, we'd like to think about 
being able to empower people to go into the landscape and measure a high tide and then measure what does one foot look beyond that and, and make a mark. So maybe not a permanent mark, maybe it's just in shock, but, yeah. um, but really being able to consider and think about. And, and so then what does that mean? We don't have the ability to change global sea level rise. We understand that, but we're an island. And so we are particularly vulnerable to it. Where, what is our resiliency and our response going to look like? And a project that we've been contemplating engaging with is um, alternative fiction, so or speculative fiction. So this use of like kind of what if and imagining what a future might look like. It doesn't have to be post-apocalyptic or necessarily you know horrible. We could have a really beautiful, empowered future. Um, but you know, engaging again the incredible creativity of artists to be able to speculate on what a future might look like given all of this information of the past and the present and projections. And how do we engage our town leadership? We know that each of the towns on MDI have um, climate uh, plans and projects that they're working on. They've uh, several have declared climate emergencies within their communities. And so how do we get involved with those conversations related to infrastructure and protection of things that we care about? So, so I will just conclude my portion and then let Jen and um, Catherine have their last words by saying that, you know, this is to me again, why history matters so much is that all of this is so important to understand in a really broader context to be able to look at how things have changed over time, how our community has responded to changes over time, and what lessons we can learn from those past experiences to apply today, because every decision that we make today is going to be analyzed and evaluated by future generations, just like we're doing today with our past. So, um, Catherine, do you want to add anything? I think I'm just going to repeat that call to pay attention. So, Start paying attention to where the high tide is. Um, start paying attention to the tide charts. Um, and also, if you know of any historical resources, you know, Rainy just shared a couple. Um, and we're really interested in anything you might have um, that might that might help us compare present um, sea levels and shoreline shape and shoreline sort of change over time. And so um we're interested in those things as well as just hearing your hearing from you about what you're seeing and experiencing along the coast. Um, I think Jerry has Jerry has a question. Well, yeah, question and and really just a comment, you guys. I think this is so. Ex I mean, this is just a fantastic project, and I want to thank uh, all of you for for working on it. I think it's so relevant and so important. And Jen. I love your concept of the fact that people always love a mystery, right? So engage people at that level. That's brilliant. And um, I can see that these stencils are going to be everywhere. <laughs> I'm already thinking about where we're going to put one in MDIBL. So um, really exciting. And, and thank you again for sharing this, sharing the update, for continuing this project, because it's just... Uh, really important. My question is, Rainey, you mentioned this sort of in your closing remarks, but in thinking about some of the visualization that Catherine showed in terms of the, you know, um, the access to the island and Thompson Island and all of that, I'm wondering, is there an ongoing conversation with either the town or DOT or, you know, in, in thinking about how to prepare and what does that look like and where are those resources going to come from? I'm just curious how that conversation is developing or if it is? So I don't have a, a great answer. I um, I know that there have been conversations taking place about um, a potential lawsuit to, uh, we're not, we would be like the eighth state that might join on to a lawsuit suing fossil fuel companies to pay for infrastructure improvements and mitigation strategies in communities that are suffering in this way. So I don't I don't know what, if Maine will join that or not or what the status of that will be, but the goal would be to acknowledge the harm that's been created, like you find in like super fun cleanup sites or other situations where egregious behavior endangers a, a certain resource or a communal community and and the companies come in to pay for a portion of it. Never enough. That is one model that's being looked at for MDI. Otherwise, one of the challenges that I think we face as an as an island is is that is 
that we're not, we don't function as one island, we're a bunch of towns, but we have island-wide problems. And so when Bar Harbor makes a decision, it may solve a problem in Bar Harbor, but it may create waves of problems that now extend into other communities that might not have been there before or might be exasperated or accelerated by the decision of one town. And one of my goals in Landscape of Change, the, the larger umbrella project, is if we can articulate and consistently communicate one common understanding of what's happening to MDI that we all agree to as a measure, then we have the ability to make island-wide decisions for those things that affect all of us equally. And to me, sea level rise is could it be more clearly affecting all of us? So, so Jerry, it's not a, a perfect answer other than I know a little bit and a further call to action is, is that we as citizens of this island really need to be actively voicing our concern for the League of Island Towns to be working collaboratively like we are to create island-wide solutions. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. And the, the I mean, I'm sorry, Rainy. And the um, the high school also seems like a great sort of central, just even physically, right? And and yeah. certainly the consolidated nature of it would would make a lot of sense. That's fantastic. Thank you. I think a big part of this project is not just drawing attention, but building consensus. I think the more people who are aware of this and start pushing town government, state government, like there was such a lost opportunity when they rebuilt Route 3 through Hull's Cove. I mean, mm. <laughs> so if there had been more understanding of this issue and more consensus about how important it is, there could have been more input about that during the public meetings. This is such an evocative presentation that you guys have done, and it's interesting that it, it, it brings up all kinds of feelings about action already. Um, I think uh, Dr. Jim Boyer uh, is looking to, to ask a question here. Well, thank you all for this great uh, presentation description of what's going on here. Now, of course, the Netherlands dealt with this problem by building these huge dikes, uh, which uh, MDI is not going to be able to do. But what are some of the things that we could be doing? I mean, building more marshes, uh, what, what uh, things of that sort that would at least slow down some of the erosion that is taking place. I mean, I think I think we need a transition from from knowing what's going on. And we don't we don't want to just sit there and describe what's going on as important as that is. But we want to also ask the question, well, you know, what can we do? I, I agree. Um, and there is a lot we can do. So so being prepared and watching means being prepared for safety right so so we have to remember that this these are dangerous situations when we think about storms and roads being washed out and people not being act to access emergency services of their own home um and so so i think about understanding where flooding problems are happening so all of the work to expand culverts so the work that's happening now in great meadow and Sertamont area of acadia national park um, to try to allow for these greater volumes of water, um, improving areas where tidal exchange has been blocked. So that is something we can do is think about being able to allow this water to move in ways that does less damage. Um, you mentioned salt marshes. Certainly there's a lot of work about um, do we have space for salt marshes, which offer really um, important protections in terms of storm surge. They help protect other parts of the coast. Um, and we may want we may want them to take over the forest in some cases, and there might be other cases where we want to protect the forest. And so, understanding where that's happening, um, things that are you know things shifts that are happening, and making decisions about those. Um, and then Rainey also mentioned this idea of sort of infrastructure and buildings, and how can we um, accommodate floods while also keeping things like um, not just houses and buildings, but wastewater and drinking water systems safe as well. We know there's an example of a house in Somesville between the gallery and the library. I have a, I have a picture of it I didn't include, but they, um, when the house was purchased by a family in the 1980s, the basement was never reported to have saltwater infiltration. And now it 
infiltrates at almost every high tide. And when we were out mm -hmm. at the Storm King tide, there were no one was in the house, but there were two huge pipes with waterfalls essentially coming out of them because they had to install an on-demand pumping system that triggers when the basement floods with salt water and the pumps just immediately start pumping that water back out and into, you know, just back out into the sea. Um, so, you know, are those kinds of things going to be necessary in certain buildings that we have? Um, I think about the bridge being rebuilt um, in the village of Somesville, where the community school is at the marsh there. Are they, I don't know the answer, but have they planned for sea level rise and are, are right, you know, raising the level of the bridge up so that we don't risk losing that or having it wash out? Um, and then our historic resources. I've had a conversation with Becky Cole Will, who is um, with the Park Service and their Cultural Resource Management Division. They had brought up a scientist from, I think, North or South Carolina to look at the impact to historic resources from sea level rise. And because of the nature of MDI being ledge and, and relatively deep ocean um, around the edges of the island, we don't have a lot of historic infrastructure that's at risk other than archeological sites. And so those we have known for a number of years are starting to erode into the sea. And in consultation with the Wabanaki, there's a desire to allow that to happen naturally and not to create barriers or, or interfere with that process. Um, so those natural resources will be, or not sorry, natural, those cultural resources will, will most likely be lost as a result of this. So that's the conversation is like the balance of what, what are we, what are we, what's okay? What do we want to fight to preserve? And what does that preservation look like? I'm curious, um, and I don't know if you thought about your next phase uh, of a project, but um, when you were working with the children, a, a, a lot a lot of your work is about, you know, evoking an emotional response um, so that people really feel it and, and, and take it in. I'm wondering when you were working with the students at MDI High, what you, you mentioned, Rainey, that they were shocked, you know, at some of the ideas. Do, do young people like that, do they, I'm curious about their emotional response and if you guys track it in any way or if you saw any sort of dominant theme, whether it was, you know, just dismissing it or whether it was shock or whether sadness or anger. Um, I know I hear a lot of anger from my kid. Um, so the, I, I mean about climate change, um, but did you, did you track that at all? What did you think about it? We did interviews with the kids prior to the project and at the end of the project. And there's a video right now, like a five minute, just sort of summary video that is being produced that we'll be able to share out with people that captures the kids' feedback. So initially the kids were not thinking that sea level rise or the king tides were a pressing issue. We, we could kind of get them to think about it, but it wasn't in my backyard sort of uh, like, it wasn't that close to them yet. By the time we were on the field trip, it was really amazing. We were at the Bass Harbor Marsh right at the, um, the Tremont Elementary School, and there was a mink that was on the edge of the, not a mink, um, was it a mink, Catherine? Right, yeah, right on the edge of the road. And its house was being inundated. And so it was sort of stressed and out and about and in the rocks. And the kids were really upset about it. And I interviewed a student right after that at, when we were at the Oceanarium and she said, we did this, but that animal is suffering from our poor decision-making. And that really upset her. But for the most part, the end interviews and the end energy from the kids was empowered and wanting to communicate to people that they wanted to find ways to just not show like a flooded MDI or that this was an inevitability. They wanted to talk to people about the fact that this is our home and this matters to us and we want you to care about it. And I have a few friends whose children were in that class and one of them reported that they were driving around, you know, just driving off the island or whatever. And their kid was like, oh, did you know that that bridge washed out in the past and it could again and we should be thinking about blah 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 and so we see that they are looking at the landscape differently as a result of this project that's an amazing testament to the, the power of 
uh, detailed knowledge to, to, you know, help you not feel helpless, mm -hmm. uh, even with something as enormous as this. Uh, so that's, that's wonderful. Uh, and it's, it's also very sad uh, that we have to put them through this. Uh, are you thinking about a next project? And, and um, I want to encourage <laughs> people to raise your hands. We're still in the middle of this one. <laughs> yeah, we haven't even gotten this one like painted yet. Yeah. But I did want to add, um, my daughter graduated from MD High, MDI High about four years ago. And she went through Ruth Bullen's class as well. And I've watched her and her friends as they move out into college and beyond. Their attitude is very much, um, what are we going to do? It's up to us. And like, I know my daughter has majored in sustainable food systems and she's at culinary school and everyone says, you know, what restaurant are you going to work for? And she's like, no, 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 no. You don't understand. We need to change on an institutional scale. So she's, she's heading out into the world going, we need to change everything from how we grow the food, how we deliver it, how we prepare it, how we get it to people. And she's not the only one. A lot of her classmates seem to be thinking really large scale. So it's fascinating to watch them just take over. And, 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 and thank goodness that to someone at that age be thinking institution at the institutional level and not just about a boutique restaurant. Uh, that's really something. Uh, we are coming up towards the end. I want to encourage anybody who has questions or comments that they'd like to get in before we sign off and you can raise your hand. Uh, here we go, Sarah White. Okay, <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes. So um, I would like to shout out A Climate to Thrive because I live in Tremont. I'm also on the Comprehensive Plan Task Force and A Climate to Thrive has really, um, has had some fantastic, I think in almost every community on the islands, resiliency. I'm not sure what the, I don't remember the title of their meetings, but I was so interested in hearing people's responses and discussions in that meeting. And you could hear like some people saying, well, years ago, we had great big storms, you know, so that's no new news, you know, and you hear that. But at the same time, they were thoughtfully thinking about it. These are people more my age, you know, older and, you know, older adults. And that has been my concern in my community is that some of the people who change comes hard to be thinking of things differently. And I felt like there was some thinking going on, even though reactions were kind of sounding a bit of pushback. So I'm really grateful to A Climate to Thrive. Um, and I feel like that's really unifying to the island. I totally agree. And I've been, I'm glad you mentioned that because I just quickly mentioned that they're one of the partners in this larger project of Landscape of Change. And um, part of why they're involved is they need the data and the information and the distilled interpretive pieces that Jen and I do with that information to take to the towns to be able to share out. They need the measurements, they need the comparables. And so that's been really a a vital tool for them to be able to make their case, which is great. And then we we are so grateful for their advocacy work because they are specifically in an advocacy role. And so um, having that component in this larger partnership makes it much more holistic that we feel like we are able to address the various needs that are a partnership like this, or it's more than a partnership, a collaboration like this really represents. So um, thank you, Sarah, for, for mentioning Climate to Thrive, because I do want to give them credit for, um, for that advocacy role that they bring to this. The, the one thing I would like to add is that they're amazing listeners. And I think that opens the minds of people who may not want to hear it. Um, they do great with that. Ed, did you have something you wanted to add? I, oh, you just muted yourself, Ed. Sorry, I thought I wasn't muted, unmuted. Am I now? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. That was a, thank you for this. It was a remarkable presentation and uh, the notion of using the past to attempt to get a look at where we're headed is very helpful because 
I think everyone knows that if you, the more time you have to deal with the problem, the more choices you have of things, you, ways you can deal with it. But two things pop out to me as something to possibly consider as you talk about this topic. One is the uh, impact of what one person does or what one town does potentially has unintended consequences that are good for them, but bad for somebody else. And yeah. how, can we, how can we have a, some kind of a way of, I don't know, reviewing, thinking about what people are doing so that we aren't, we aren't you know, passing it off to somebody else. And the second thing is, this is not an MDI problem. This is a world problem. And there are parts of the world where they are further along the curve toward, toward bad outcomes than, than we are. And perhaps we can have, we, I don't know who we is here, but we could find ways of being in contact with, whether it's Holland or I don't know where, uh, where, where people have dealt with this longer and had more experience and there might be things that they've achieved and, and worked on that we could learn and benefit ourselves. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. There's so much opportunity and, um, you know, for, for community-wide discussions, for, for forums, for um, the League of Towns to try to, you know, for us to present to them and try to create a common thing many different studies that we need to embark on and analysis of you know sort of what is the the driving force behind some of these changes and what are we able to control and what are we at the mercy of and we need to be able to respond to the the biggest hurdle is resources right like the historical society has two full-time staff and we're tiny and um we are working like lions on this project because we're passionate about it and because our partnership is so successful in this in this uh landscape of change project scudic same thing right the the resources that we have dedicated and poor jen like we just pull her along and like, find grants when we can and just rely on her passion for for this and, and try to acknowledge in some small way the commitment that she's made uh, in the financial hit for the time that she takes in for us but there's no way we pay her what she deserves for it um and and so Grants are, are, you know, we're trying to go out and, and seek more funding and support. We've had a really amazing response from private donors who want to fund specific aspects of the project, which has um, been a really successful model for us. So um, there's so much great energy and then it's just like the time to be able to do it. And so if there are people interested in getting more involved or volunteering or becoming part of the project or leading off spinoffs, like we would encourage that kind of opportunity for more and diverse voices and engagement and ideas because the more energy that's generated around this and inspired by it, like we're not in control of anything, you know, like go do it and enjoy it and learn it then I just think of the better it's going to be for exactly what you said, Ed, that island-wide understanding and, and and then looking out to other places that are dealing with this too. Well, and I would say bring in the Park Service uh, and communicate to the people who are interested in the, uh, the history of uh, the park itself uh, and these, uh, uh, which of course is feeling all of these changes as well. And I'm sure Catherine, you probably have projects going around this already. Um, and I can tell from this that uh, people are going to want to keep on asking questions and and uh, furthering this conversation. Uh, I think all of you are probably fairly well easy to find, but I'd like to encourage people in the audience to uh, uh, give us a ring and we can get you back in touch with people. But uh, Anna kindly put up everybody's emails. We should probably leave that on for a few minutes just if anybody wants to take it down. Um, and, you know, I'm already you know, composing an email in my head to you guys with so many more questions and ideas. And uh, so I, I imagine this will be pretty fruitful and look forward to uh, an, a, another uh, rendition of this. And please keep us informed of where you are out and about. And we will try to uh, mention that uh, to our uh, the people that we can communicate with easily because it's clearly very important. Uh, so thank you. One date, actually, sorry, friends. Yes, really yeah, please, well, that please. Is that I meant to say this earlier. Um, we are actually going to be out at the Oceanarium on June 10th. They're having an ocean festival, and Catherine and I will be there that day talking about the sea level project. And Jen's installation will be available and unveiled, sort of for the first time interpreted at the site. So if you want to see Jen's sea level installation in real 
real place. Um, come to the Oceanarium on June 10th and Catherine and I will be able to talk about it. And then from that point on, we're hoping to be able to make the stencils available to people for a project, but we want to do the initial installation at the Oceanarium as our test site. Um, so yeah, come on June 10th, chat with us about it, and um, we're happy to give you more information. That's great. Thank you. And, and I'll mention that two days after that is our next science cafe on June 12th. Uh, it's Art Meets Science again, although in a different context, uh, with uh, our president, Dr. Holler, who's an enthusiast uh, around the arts uh, and where they uh, can uh, have a good conversation going with uh, science. And he'll be joined by Aaron Rosen, uh, who is a, a writer and a scholar of religion. Uh, and uh, 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 very knowledgeable person, so that that and that one will be in person at uh, five o'clock on campus here. Uh, so you can keep a lookout for that. So uh, I'll just thank you all of you so much for this, uh, uh, Rainy Branch and Jennifer Boer uh, and uh, Catherine Schmidt. It's just terrific, and I, I can't wait for to see where this goes next. Thanks so much.